Hi, my name is Joe Cernick. I'm a member of the faculty here at Lindenwood University, and I'd like to welcome you to uh, Insight. Uh, Insight is a show where we normally discuss books on politics, both domestically and internationally, uh, sometimes historical books that provide some insight into the present or sometimes some broader atmospheric or trend analysis books. Uh, today's book uh, as sort of is political. It's about globalization, uh, but specifically about international finance. It's written by David Schmick. And the title of the book is The World is Curbed, Hidden Dangers to the Global Economy. Now, joining me on the show today are three Lindenwood University students. To my immediate right is Allison Kinster. To Allison's right is Marina Vela. And to Marina's right is Taylor Swinford. Now, I wanted to read an opening quote and then we can jump into a discussion about the book. So the author writes, why the United States, despite its federal government deficits in the 1980s, went on to survive and prosper as an economy can be stated in one word, globalization. When most people picture globalization, they don't immediately picture financial market traders or trillions of dollars moving around the globe. They think of a Kentucky Fried Chicken franchise plopped down in the middle of downtown Beijing. Discussing capital flows may not be as exciting as a new computer wizardry developed by specialists living on separate continents, but the financial markets are what got globalization started. Before the 1980s, the United States was a relatively closed system except for some global trade, largely in goods. Capital tended to remain at home. It was as if each country owned its own private pool of capital from which it financed economic expansion. So basically, uh, Smick starts off the book with explaining how fragile our global financial system really is and how people don't truly understand it and that it takes a certain type of person to really grasp the concept of globalization and everything about it. And he went ahead and said that today we find ourselves in a situation in which the globalized financial system both enables and threatens our national well-being. And I thought that spoke volumes to really what he was starting to get at with the opening of his book. Yeah. Financial markets are like the basis of the globalization most of it and then um, trading and deal with other countries among is like the definition of the wealth of one country and on the other hand I think that having a McDonald's in the middle of Beijing is also like a, a way of global globalization expanding around the world and a Western influence in the US. I definitely um, I kind of I agree with that opening quote in the sense that I always thought of globalization as like exchange of like technology, culture, um, and things like that around the world. But when he states that the financial markets are what got it started, it, it really clicked. I mean, you can't get all of these different goods and services and other things around the world without also sharing the capital as well. Fragile certainly is a word which he uses a lot. So there was a quote I liked. He said, a small village in Arctic Norway can see its entire financial future destroyed because its financial managers invested heavily in a Citicorp project called the collateralized debt obligation. When the housing markets an ocean away in Florida and California collapsed, the debt obligation soured and the Norwegian village had to shut down kindergartens and health care services for the elderly. And so he's trying to show you, you know, that, well, this is important, but, and he keeps using that word fragile because I think I certainly picked it up at least 40 different places somewhere in the book. Um, I think he really went on to talk about um, how he really got the name of the book, too. He said that the financial world, um, in the financial world, nothing happens in a straight line, which kind of goes off the title of how the world is curved. Uh, we can't see ahead and we're always surprised because the world is curved, which makes it a dangerous place. So I feel like he was kind of talking about how, like, we expect one thing to happen, but anything can really happen. And he at one point says that um, we live in a globalized world where the 
economic model under which we have operated for more than two decade, decades, the emerging market export model is crash landing. And I thought that was the perfect word. Loaded language is what I would use, it, it's, call it, it essentially is how it was crash landing. It makes me think of a plane that's just like out of control and it just spirals. And I think it really got to the point of what he's trying to get at. Mm -hmm. Agreeing with the author, I think fragile is like one word that describes perfectly like the economy of a country because a lot of people depend on the economy. Like the population can suffer if one economy or financial system goes wrong. So that's why it, it makes sense being fragile. He, he described the global economy as like an intricate web. So something in a small village, like you said, could, you know, could be destroyed by something completely different across the world basically, mm -hmm. um, which is really interesting because it, it doesn't seem like in the past that wasn't, that wasn't the case, but because the financial market has become so globalized, it, that, is, that is the case. There are, there are cities halfway across the world that are going to be impacted by things that happen internally in the United States. Yeah, that quote, another quote that I like regarding fragile, he says, the world today lacks a financial doctrine or even much in the way of a set of informal understandings for establishing order in a financial crisis. Instead, we have to grope and manage incrementally, like trying to perform delicate brain surgery with one hand tied behind our back and the other wearing an ill-fitting boxing glove. I thought that was honestly not not funny to a point, but the fact that that's how he described it as, it, it shows just how intricate it truly is. Uh, the, it basically was explaining that the financial markets um, that we have today have just become enormous and just too big to handle um, and that it, at times it's becoming too threatening to our government in general and the governmental institutions within and it's really hard for them to maintain their stability just because of how crazy everything is happening and how everything is so fragile. One thing, like she said, that someone could be like, why, why does that affect something like this. Why does that matter? Why are we worried about it? But like she said, the web, if one thing happens, it's kind of like a trickle down effect. Yeah, and another thing is that the financial world is like, they have a lot of ups and downs. So one moment could be like in the, in the top and then in down, and these impacts in the other countries and the other financial markets around the world. Yeah, the two countries he's sort of feeling can create severe problems are China and India. Mm -hmm. And so he seems like, uh, well, the book is written in 2008, comes out in 2008, but it seems like he's still waiting for something big to pop in China that can cause a problem for everyone else. And India has the potential to do that, but I guess he's first waiting for some problems to emerge out of, an, and he uses terminology, a bubble. And so you have bubbles in every economy, and sooner or later they deflate and go down, and so as a result, that's what he's waiting for in the case of China. He addresses these bubbles quite often, even later in the book, when he discusses um, the Japanese housewives, how um, everyone was kind of relying on certain bubbles, and eventually those kind of bubbles burst. Um, I think it was important that he discussed how, uh, like I said earlier, not many people understand these issues, and not many people can fully grasp them. And he was one of those people that he felt he could. So one day when he was at a dinner party in Washington, he started to explain to people um, that one of the main issues ec economists struggle with is how to survive and prosper in this troubling new system. And that he was shocked to see just how many people, like the average person, would have no clue what's going on. Like before reading this book, personally, I wouldn't know half the amount of information that was in this book and what was going on during this time frame that was looked at during this book. Um, and I thought it was important that he said, I felt that I needed to kind of teach the average person what's going on because otherwise people, like I said, would question, well, why does this matter? Uh, the race and the fast quick in economy of these two countries, China and India, like makes the U.S. like more vulnerable and also like kind of the, the straight competence. So they have to kind of manipulate and deal and trade with them to establish like the standards of the economy. Yeah, he states that everyone, well, everyone who's involved in economics complains about something, like for instance, China stabilizing its currency or the US and European debt. Um, but he also says that, I mean, no one's really coming up with a solution to it, which I found kind of interesting because he presses a lot in the book that we need less government regulation on the economy because, because it's so, it's so unpredictable that a lot of times 
these small policy changes or implementations completely throw mm -hmm. off economies in all over the world, basically. It, going off of that, people lose trust with, with our economies, Go, like learning about that kind of stuff and figuring out that one little policy can throw off something potentially huge. Um, and they, everyone's losing trust in everything like that, so people are going to start, um, I guess, being more frugal and keeping things more to themselves and not really trusting our government, let alone somebody else's. Yeah, another quote on his fragile system, he says, like death from a thousand cuts, financial crises come from a series of small, seemingly benign, but dangerously destabilizing changes that reach a terrifying tipping point of market uncertainty and fear. That is what happened during the subprime crisis. And so the subprime was an outgrowth of uh, the mortgage situation that hit in 2008. And so, again, he's this is a guy, I thought it was interesting because this is a guy who is an advisor to uh, both Republicans and Democrats, mm -hmm. members of Congress. When you were saying that so many people are sort of unaware and uninformed, it, he's talking about members of Congress and <laughs> didn't seem to be able to understand things that they were supposed to be involved with. And so he goes on about that. Yeah, well, we can say like in the 2008 or nine, like, United States like suffer like a little bit of crisis or depression and as well I can talk the same in happened in my country we suffered a lot of crisis during that period of time and that sometimes is because of bad management of the situation and because the political is too much involved in the financial and economic system of a country he uh, one of my favorite things he he says regarding like the fragility of the economic system is he he compares the global financial market to a rich, generous, but deeply paranoid great uncle. And I thought that was pretty funny. He says that like the uncle would you know, go around the family and sprinkle money here and there, depending on the situation or who might need it most, um, taking into account different situations. But then all at the same time gets really paranoid and um, cuts off the family of all the money. And that, that's, what he, that's the metaphor he used to compare the, the fragility of the global market. And I, I, mean, I thought that was... It was, it, was, it was funny, but it was good. I mean, I it made love, a lot of sense. Yeah, I love his comparisons because not only was there that one, the one that I had mentioned earlier, but also, or you had mentioned earlier about the surgery, brain surgery with one behind your back. Um, he also compared uh, our subprime loan issue with where we sold our sub, uh, subprime loans to different places in Europe and Asia as toxic waste. So essentially we put our toxic, to toxic waste and spread it out, but nobody knew where we put it. So that's where this huge issue formed about everything and anything. And again, that caused a lot of lack of trust and it caused a lot of issues at hand. But I just thought it was incredible that everything he does in order for his audience to better grasp it, he compares it to anything and everything that would make better sense, so like the great uncle, the surgery, or the toxic, toxic waste issue. He, uh, <clears throat> what he was sort of talking about, because he had referred to that in the crisis, now I think because of when the book is written, and he's referring to events leading up to 2008, that you saw too much money <coughs> pouring into three-month U.S. security bills. Mm -hmm. And he said, so as a result, you're tying your money up just for short term because you don't know where you want to put it. And he says that was very much like the Great Depression, people stuffing money in a mattress. And so not a good thing. Yeah, because they had lost trust. <clears throat> so, uh, but there are, uh, he still likes globalization. Yeah. We spent time talking about the fragile part of it, but he's saying without it, that's what helped to elevate standard of livings around the world and which even helped the American economy in the 1980s. It's sort of interesting that you're getting conservatives and Republicans uh, talking, well, today we're sort of taping it in a period when the uh, Republicans are considering a tax cut bill before Congress and that uh, President Trump would like to sign it, I guess, before Christmas. But so then they, you constantly listen back to people saying, oh, it's Ronald Reagan's tax cut of the 1980s and look what it did to the American economy. Yet when you read this book, he's not talking about the Reagan tax mm -hmm. cut. He's saying that Jimmy Carter administration allowed uh, annuity money to now be taken out of blue chip investments put into entrepreneurial development, and that money started to have a big impact as we're 
getting into the 80s, and then globalization of money, where overseas money started to come into the United States when you had this Reagan tax cut help to keep our interest rates low. It drove up the value of the dollar against the yen, but it was still very useful. So you now he's sort of talking about the idea that globalization of money coming in in the 1980s, the Jimmy Carter uh, situation that allowed uh, the idea of annuity accounts to take large sums of money to help out the growth of small businesses and entrepreneurs, which wouldn't have been allowed before that, are more important than the Reagan tax cuts of the early 1980s. He addresses tons of issues, and he also, like you said, talks about going back and kind of looking at things, but he specifically talks about really going back in the last two decades and looking at what happened within the last two decades, and he said that there were, there were several positive um, impacts because of how our government was um, reacting to things, such as um, in slightly more than two decades, he said that the global free market experienced an unprecedented doubling of its labor force, so it went from 2.7 billion uh, jobs to six billion, which to any person, if you look at that, that's more than double. That just skyrocketed and it shows that even though there are several, um, not benefits, but um, there are several benefits, but there's also sev uh, several negativities, but this was definitely a benefit that it increased the job force. Globalization has been like so far um, a positive thing to the world because they raise like the middle class creation, like they create a lot of new jobs and the number of poverty like just raise as well. And also the Carter like new implements, like they allowed the country to save money and develop the financial system. He also mentions that at the same time that the shift towards the global financial market was happening, that we had our most successful period of mass poverty reduction, not just in the United States, but in like the history of mankind. Uh, ben Stein, who's sort of a comedian but an economist, and he wrote this article in the New York Times, and so the author refers to it. He said, the article said, quote, how are the risks in Thailand or Brazil or Indonesia intrinsically related to problems in a housing truck in Las Vegas? Why should a mortgage company in Long Island have anything to do with them? And so then the author is trying to say, well, this is your problem. You've got this money all over the world. And he said uh, that you're trying to figure out what's going on. And basically his thing was that people had no information. So that that's what creates the uncertainty and the panic, sort of, was you had this no information. Yeah, Smick uh, goes on to say that the reason why this is so important is that we today live in a globalized era, and this is important to everyone because you are a part of this era, um, where financial markets have been internationalized through an intricate web, going back to the web sh that she had addressed earlier, um, which I feel like Ben Stein's comments were basically what I was addressing earlier. Why does these why did these little things happen and how did they have a play or a role in all of this? But because of the web, um, globalization, it, it affects everyone. It's important to make um, people know like the sense of globalization because if like is the entrepreneurs in the industries who are going to raise like the economy of a country mm -hmm. and the global capital. So they, we have to make sure like the people know about it. Mm -hmm. um, in regards to the, the uncertainty, he also states that if we if we or policymakers in general overreact to that uncertainty, it's going to either continue the crisis or it can worsen it as well. Yeah, his quote, I, another one I like, he says, the best metaphor I can summon is that global financial markets are a bit like a rich, generous, but occasionally deeply paranoid great uncle. Uh, suddenly, a feeling of paranoia overtakes him. Suddenly, he's wary of the landscape. A panicked great uncle cuts off the sprigate of money. What precipitates the sudden paranoia? Nothing more and nothing less than the lack of a clear, unambiguous, and reliable information of what is going on. The great uncle thinks his relatives are not telling him everything he needs to know. They are holding back on him. Well, and then he compared it to the great uh, credit crisis. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, he basically said, like the great uncle panic, not due to the subprime mortgage default or the U.S. housing bubble that spread beyond its shores. The panic resulted because nobody could say with financial institutions, 
which financial institutions had the subprime toxic waste and what price. And like I said, he kind of interconnects everything. And it goes back up to show um, earlier he had quoted someone in the book, Eric Jacobson from um, Chicago research firm Morningstar, stated that there are so many interconnections today um, between different parts of the market that otherwise seem so disparate. Um, but globalization fails to explain why almost overnight, overnight the financial markets appeared to split from reality. Yeah, um, he's still positive that, you know, I mean, basically one of the things he's sort of doing is saying we got to look at where all this money was used and that if we stayed with an old system pre-1980s, you'd be having banks only investing in things that are sort of very stable and don't grow too much anymore, whereas what we needed was all this new money that floated around freely to sort of invest in smaller companies and entrepreneurs to see growth in not just the United States, but many countries overseas. And he says, so without all that uh, sort of free-floating capital all over the place, we're in a problem. So there's like, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. And so he's looking both ways. And at the same time, he's saying governments are starting to get too involved. Mm -hmm. We need them to back up a little. But still, at the same time, he's not sort of talking stupid language and saying, no, get rid of all government regulation. Mm -hmm. He's trying to figure out, well, we have to cut back a bit here, but we got to still keep it. But we don't want to have that this much. But we And so he's trying to find a balance rather than talking moronically stupid cable news teams. Yeah, he said the situation was exacerbated by the sudden complexity of the financial system. Mm -hmm. Um, as a result of the securitization, um, which then resulted in the lack of transparency. And I think that uh, kind of divulges into a whole new issue in itself is the securitization. I think a good way to balance like the globalization market and capital is like the creation of the G7 and the G8 and the IMF. They just kind of uh, try to balance the capital and the globalization at all. He says, the bad news is that today's spectacular global economy is both unstable and unsettling. As jobs and investment move around the world, people lose incomes and pensions. And as these enormous shifts occur, the economic benefits of the system are often unfairly distributed. There's not a lot of security in a fast-paced global economy where workers get ahead by chasing opportunities. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, again, what you're looking at is, you know, again, that's sort of, again, I've been reading quotes through this show on his uh, reference to uh, instability and a fragile system, but still he likes it, you know. Mm -hmm. he, he talked about his own investment in a Chinese cement plant mm -hmm. and that they put money in and they were sort of under the impression they were going to do well and then they didn't and he, they lost money. And he realized that, one, he didn't know anything about cement, so he shouldn't have invested in it. But then he realized that there was a lot of accounting trickery that was going on. So there wasn't sort of transparency. And he, so he didn't have upfront honest information. So he learned a, a sort of a lesson never to put his own money where he didn't know anything about the business. Which I feel like is a whole um, point behind the book is that like I said, nobody quite knows what's going on, even the people in Congress. So why should they be so, not involved, but why should they, they need to learn more about it before they can adequately speak on it and make decisions about the whole globalization in general, about whether they should push it or not. And we can talk specifically about China. They are one of the one of the odds that they like raise and grow so fast the economy, but not like using the standards that almost all the democratic countries use. They are just like these communists and they follow the rules and the state like just rule everything and it's been so beneficial for them because they raised so fast and they had like enormous growth. Yeah, he says that um, that basically the World Bank and the IMF are being undermined and underbidded by China and India and other countries that are up and coming in the global market. Um, they are handing out really cheap loans, subsidized loans that are they're tied to like the exchange of goods and services or commodities, mainly oil. Um, but their loans have no environmental or human rights standards either. So, I mean, people are, you know, flocking to these loans, and it's kind of, it's it is undermining the 
the World Bank and the loans that they have to offer. Which Go ahead. Oh, which created a bunch of tension in the global economy in general, talking about China. And he ex uh, explained that a perception that's growing about China is that it's benefiting from the global system of trading goods and commodities, but it does so little to enhance the stability of our system, and at times it completely undermines it, which I think is the whole issue of the book in itself. I thought, uh, again, you know, contrary to... Uh, Trump himself and people that want to support his notion of we're in a state of paranoia about globalization. He's got a good quote here from a former Secretary General of the United States. He says, the main losers in today's very unequal world are not those who are too much exposed to globalization. They are those who have been left out. And then he quotes from a guy at uh, the Peterson Institute for International Economics who says that without all this globalization, and the quote is $1 trillion richer each year because of globalized trade. So that uh, even though we can question sort of what's going on, we're still doing uh, fairly well. Uh, we only have a few minutes left. So uh, what did you think of this book and I, uh, recommend it or not to the viewers? I personally, I wouldn't say that I don't recommend it. I would just say that make sure that they have a, um, a significant amount of time to read it. Because personally, I felt like I would understand it more if I had the opportunity to go back and read it three times mm -hmm. um, to fully grasp what he was saying. So yes, I do recommend it, especially if one wants to really understand globalization and securitization in our government in general. Uh, but I think that he was very... Um, good with his quotes and his comparisons, but at the same time, it was kind of anecdotal in a way. Everything was a story, and it came back to how fragile our economy was. Um, I will recommend the book, and I think it's so interesting because it explains like the financial markets and the global economy, but it's good to have like a background in finance, mm -hmm. so you will enjoy more the book. Mm -hmm. And also, like there's a lot of terms and vocabulary about finance, so mm -hmm. that's a little bit hard. Uh, economics isn't typically my favorite topic, but he did. I, I really liked a lot of the metaphors he used and the different analogies to help explain um, different situations that in regards to the globalization of the financial market. Um, he really, I think he did a good jo job of explaining what the, the global market is, um, the goods and the bads relating it to the past and to the present and possibly future. Um, and I, I think he, he made it pretty easy to wrap your head around and make sense of the topic in general. Yeah, I, uh, I liked the book, but then uh, I used to head the graduate international business program here, so one of the courses I regularly taught at the graduate level was international finance. So uh, when I'm reading it, I realize, oh, wait a minute, people are going to be reading this and not always have a background, so it does take a while to get yourself through it. It's a very good book. And I, I like it, uh, but I do understand it's complex and it's going to take a little bit to get through. And my notes were extensive on the sides to try and take some of his complex ideas. And the quotes I had, I tried not to read quotes from him that were too incredibly complex, but gave a sense of what he was trying to get across. So, yeah, um, so good book, but plan on taking your time. Thank you for joining us today.